Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes is produced by NJ Advanced Media. Subscribe and listen to the show at nj.com slash podcast. Join the conversation on Twitter by using hashtag Rebuilding Rutgers. The last time Rutgers was in the national championship conversation was in November of 2006. The Scarlet Knights were the 15th ranked football program in the country, preparing to welcome third ranked Louisville to Piscataway for a Thursday night game on ESPN. Both teams were 8 0, and each was eyeing a major bowl game. The stakes were high, the anticipation was even higher. By the end of the night, Rutgers fans were left with a memory they'd never forget a 28 25 win many consider the greatest in school history. Welcome to Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes. I'm Joe Giglio. It has been a decade since the phrase pandemonium in Piscataway was first spoken. At the time, Rutgers had never beaten a team ranked as high as number three. NJ Advanced Media reporter Steve Politti and Ryan Dunleavy spoke to many of the key figures in that Rutgers-Louisville game, including players Ray Rice, Brian Leonard, and Mike Teal. Now, on the 10th anniversary, we take you back to that memorable week. Here's Steve Politti. Brom under center, takes the snap, drops back. He is sacked! Yes! And the Scarlet Knights win it! There is pandemonium in Piscataway! Rutgers has knocked off number three, Louisville, 28 to 25, and they are going insane at Rutgers Stadium. It is the biggest win in school history, and in the Greg Schiano era, they came all the way back down 25-7 and the Scarlet Knights have pulled it off they are 9-0 and they continue to chop away admit it if you were a Rutgers fan even 10 years later listening to that gave you chills you were transported back to one of the happiest nights of your life to a stadium teeming with emotion anticipation and yes pandemonium and make no mistake you're not alone I still have the DVD, you know, where I, where I watch it. I remember my old perspective of um, college football just changing in that moment. And um, I, it's an undeniable feeling. And, it, you know, it's one of the moments where just where they are now and where they're going, that's a moment that just like no one can ever take away accomplishments or achievements. But that moment for Rutgers football program will forever be remembered and be part of Rutgers history forever. That's Ray Rice, the star running back on that Rutgers team. He considers that night one of the best of his life. We talked to about 20 people involved in that moment, both on the field and off it, and nearly all of them say the same thing. The Rutgers-Louisville game on November 9, 2006, is the rare big-time sporting event that not only lived up to the hype, but exceeded it. Rutgers was down big, then stormed back, then defeated the number three team in the nation on a field goal with 13 seconds left. Fans rushed the field, then had to race back to the sideline when one second remained in the clock, then rushed it again. But that game is something else, too. It is the high-water mark for a program in its 147th season. Rutgers, the birthplace of college football, had never won a game that big before or since. On the 10-year anniversary of that victory, current head coach Chris Ash is trying to recapture that magic and put the Scarlet Knights back into the national spotlight. To understand the significance of that game, you have to know a little bit about Rutgers football history. This is the program that helped invent the sport, playing its very first game in 1869. But from there, it gets rocky. A Rutgers fan in November 2006, regardless of his or her age, had never seen this program win a single bowl game. Meanwhile, the memories of the struggle, a 1-11 season in 2002, an 80-7 loss to West Virginia, a Sports Illustrated story with the headline, Can Rutgers Ever Win? were fresh. Greg Schiano, then the head coach, was supposed to change all that. But would he? Brian Leonard, a talented running back from upstate New York, was one of the first high school stars to truly buy in. You know, I know a lot of people thought I was crazy for going to Rutgers. I had other other, uh, options to go to college, and I just believed in Coach Schiano and what he was telling us, and I believed in his philosophy and and his vision. And I really dreamed and I hoped, and I really saw the same vision Schiano did, and that really came full circle to that night. Rutgers was on nobody's radar when the season began. But week after week, the Scarlet Knights kept winning. 
They even cracked the top 25 rankings, but making people believe this team was for real was a much harder task. Yes, they were 8-0, and but few experts believe they would give Louisville, ranked number three in the nation, much of a game. On campus, the anticipation was palpable. Students camped out overnight to claim their tickets, and when Shiano showed up with free pizza around midnight, he was greeted like a conquering hero. Rutgers, which had struggled for years to get anyone to go to games, even added temporary bleachers in the end zone to accommodate extra fans. The players, defensive lineman Jamal Westerman said, noticed that during practice. You know, I always heard a story that, you know, they were giving out tickets at Subway. You know, you get a $5 foot long and you get the tickets to the game, but for that game, you know, in the, in the practices throughout the week, you know, they put in the stands in the end zone. So we're like, extra stands? I mean, man, this is going to be packed. This is going to be loud. And, you know, as a defensive, you know, group, we knew the fans were going to come out for this game. So that week, we worked in practice on not only communicating verbally, but a lot of nonverbal hand signals. Kevin McConnell, who was then an associate athletic director, remembers how he used to take game film into Manhattan and hand deliver it to local TV networks in hopes that they would air a clip or two. But that week, ESPN was televising the game in primetime, and all the local stations were doing live shots during the nightly news. The, the one that keeps sticking out in it is because of my media background, the satellite trucks lined up all across the artificial turf field, F3, and that you the cell, you could not get any cell service. But, but, and there were TV trucks. I mean, it was, you know, obviously everybody in New York, you know, all six New York stations, it was Philly, it was ESPN, it was... That's the one thing that just blew my mind. When you just looked, and it was like satellite row, and it was just, it had to be, it had to be 16 to 20 satellite trucks. Now that had, ne- I mean, you were lucky to get one satellite truck. And now there's 16 to 20 lines. That, to me, that, that one steep sticks out in my mind more than, more than anything. And there were a lot of things that stuck out in my mind, but that's the one that really, really hit home to me, like, oh my God, we, we, we've arrived, we are, you know, we're big news, and everybody's going live from the stadium, and that I thought was impressive. But maybe the biggest attraction before the game was the arrival of Mike Francesa and Chris Russo, the top sports radio duo in New York. They had never done a remote broadcast from a college football game. When Rutgers was a topic on Mike and the Mad Dog, it was almost always just to mock the football program in Piscataway. In case you don't recognize the voice, this is the Mad Dog. Remember, we had a lot of, a lot of people didn't like us because we thought we were anti-Rutgers. Because we never, we, Mike too was the same way. We never thought Rutgers was that big a deal. So a lot of the fans didn't like the idea, you know, that we were basically jumping on the bandwagon. So they were kind of torn. On the one hand, they perceived that they had arrived at a big time ESPN. Mike and me, they love that. But the other... There was another section, another group, the feeling that we were, in fact, jumping on the bandwagon and who we, we never were on Rutgers' side. We always picked on Shiano and all that kind of thing. So why, in fact, should we now be part of it? So half the fans loved us there, the other half of the fans said, what the hell are they here now for? It was weird. We sort of were beloved in one half and hated in the other half. In a lot of ways, the story of Mike and Amanda anyway. Everything just seemed to come together that week. A huge rainstorm had drenched Piscataway, but it came the night before. The major Bowl Scouts, those influential college football power brokers, had chosen this night to visit the stadium. The signs on the New Jersey Turnpike read, Go Ruckers, Beat Louisville. Oh, and the Empire State Building? It was lit up in red. When the team arrived at the stadium, McConnell was worried that the crowd rushing to greet the players might actually start rocking the bus. Mike Teal the young quarterback for the Scarlet Knights, was on that bus. The Scarlet Walk, a tradition where the players walk through the crowd and into the stadium, was Teal's first sign that this was going to be a special night. It was the most incredible sight I had ever seen. And when we were pulling up on the bus, the traffic down Route 18 to get onto campus was, you know, ridiculous. And it was a 7th. 30 or whatever time game is a night game so you figure some people were coming from work and that's why and that wasn't why this night there wasn't a spot to be found and the traffic was all the way down you know past the Hyatt on, on 18 and I just remember coming on the campus and seeing just tons and tons of people and then getting up to the Scarlet Walk the people were overflowing I'd never seen that many people around that statue for that walk 
it was kind of a moment where I, I remember looking at Type 1 Underwood, we sit right, we sit right next to each other on the bus, right across from each other on the bus, and we just kind of both gave a little smirk, and, and we knew that that's why we came to Rutgers for, for this night. Teal would hit Underwood, one of his favorite receivers, for an early touchdown. But the game did not unfold the way people in the stadium had wanted. Louisville opened a 25-7 lead, and while no one knew it at the time, it made what happened next even better. If you're looking for some fiery speech that changed the course of the game, you're not going to find it. The players remembered a calming presence in the locker room at halftime. Shiano told them where they needed to make corrections, and he told them they were going to win. Here's Teal again. A lot of times you're going at halftime and you're down, and halftime goes so fast. you got to run all the way up into the locker room. You sit down. You, you know, the coaches start yelling for a little bit, and the players start, you know, kind of not yelling at each other, but, but saying, saying things like, you know, it's, get our heads out of our butts and let's go and you know we're better than that and there wasn't any of that that night it was you know we got up in there and and we sat down and there were snicker bars in our lockers like there always were and we just kind of took a deep breath and said you know we're fine we just gotta we just gotta go out and execute this half and uh and that's what we did it was it was weird It it was like it wasn't like any other game that's that's the truth teal found kenny Britt, his most dynamic playmaker for a 67 yard pass Britt fumbled, but somehow the ball bounced right back into his hands. Rice scored on the next play. It was 25-20 Louisville with four minutes left in the third quarter when Chiano did something unconventional. He went for the two-point conversion, a huge gamble. It worked. Teal hit tight end Dennis Campbell in the end zone. Rutgers trailed just 25-22. The offense did just what it had to do, but the defense, it was phenomenal. It was almost as if the Scarlet Knights knew what play Louisville was going to run before the ball was snapped. Rutgers tied the game on a 46-yard field goal from Jeremy Ito with 10 minutes left. The defense stuffed Louisville again. Rutgers got the ball back on its 9-yard line with 5 minutes left. Teal methodically led the offense to the Rutgers 35 when the Scarlet Knights faced a crucial third down play. The quarterback threw to Leonard, who rumbled for 26 yards. On this third down, I know the ball is coming to me. I look for the first down markers, and I know exactly what yard line I have to get to that first down. Um, so I was doing that, and, uh, you know, went on the snap of the ball. It was a swing screen out to the right. And um, I know Jeremy Zuda is coming out in front and, and blocking for me. And I focused on the ball, caught the ball, and it was really wide open. I mean, there, was, there wasn't many people there at all. So I knew I was getting the first down, but I wanted more, too. I wanted to get as close as we could to get to that field goal. And uh, actually, I remember getting tackled on that play, and I hurt my shoulder pretty good, but I didn't want to come out. And the next play, I had to block a power O for Ray Rice with a bad shoulder. That didn't surprise anyone. Here's Rice again. He really did so many things that he was a matchup nightmare for people because he was like the strongest guy on the team, pound for pound. He was used to running it, and then he was by far No disrespect to our receivers, the best catcher on our team. But you put him in situations where you just kind of like get him the ball and uh, screen screen pass with a guy that fast, that strong, and that will and and that determination. And I I just knew anytime there was a play designed for Brian, you expected like some a miracle to happen. And uh, you know, and that's what he did. You know, he he was he was definitely you know a game changer. On the next play, it was Rice's turn. He broke off a 20-yard run in his typical style, turning a small hole into a big gain. Teal knew, with each step his running back took, that the Scarlet Knights were getting closer to history. We ran power, and Ray kind of, we creased him, and Ray kind of hit it. And and I just remember being on the hash mark, and he was running down the hash mark, and I had a clear view of which that usually didn't happen. Usually there were bodies in the way. Like, holy shoot, we're going to win this game. Ah, but this is Rutgers, and nothing would be that easy. Shiano played for the field goal. Ito, after all, had already hit a 46-yarder. Ito was well on his way to a career that would establish him as one of the best kickers in school history. He ran onto the field for a 33-yard field goal that would put Rutgers ahead with just 20 seconds left. Rutgers broadcaster Chris Carlin set up the drama for the radio audience. The kick is on its way, and it is no good. Wide to the left, but hang on, there's a flag down. There is a flag down. Not everyone saw that flag. 
Anthony Cali, Rutgers placeholder, saw Louisville cornerback William Gay jump offside from the corner of his eye. But would the referees? Then he saw the flag and knew, mercifully, that Ito would get a second chance. It was up to Cali to calm everyone down. My road roommate and, and the guy backed up at tight end, Clark Harris, was, was the, the long and short snapper on, on all special teams. So my, my, my job was kind of corral, you know, make calls on, on punt and, and, and field goals and things of that nature. So, you know, Clark had a few choice words for, for Jeremy uh, at the time, some that can't be repeated, and, and a lot of four-letter words. So getting Clark to calm down and just understand that getting, you know, Yelling at our kicker at that point probably wasn't a good idea. I think he got the message that I think the entire we all wanted to make the kick. So, uh, you know, it was just kind of regrouping, uh, getting everybody to, to, to kind of, you know, especially up front, you know, protect um, and, and really, you know, just work on everything we've done in the past. There was a strong sentiment that, given a second chance, Ida would not miss again. This time, his kick was perfect. He turned and pointed at a camera suspended over the field, drawing the ire of his head coach that week in a team meeting. Here's how Ito remembers it. I still don't know if he was joking or not, to be honest. I mean, I, come on, that's, that's pure emotion at that point. I, you know, there was just seconds left in the game. We had won the game, you know, and that was just, oh my gosh, we're going we're gonna to beat the number three team. That wasn't... I, I couldn't tell you what it was, to be honest. I mean, I guess you just saw it as like a selfish thing, and that wasn't my intention at all. Rutgers had a 28-25 lead, but the game was not over. A scary moment came on the ensuing kickoff when it appeared Louisville might take it all the way for the touchdown. Till remembered thinking, after all that, this is how we're going to lose? But the Louisville kick returner was tackled. The fans rushed the field, but the game was not over. There was still one second left, enough time for a Hail Mary pass from Louisville quarterback Brian Brom. Here's Devron Thompson, one of the key players in that defense, describing what happened. He's going to throw a Hail Mary. Um, we knew he had the arm and had good receivers, so usually teams run prevent defense. You see it all the time, uh, like college football a couple of weeks ago, you know, people go prevent defense. So um, we had talked about it being in that situation with uh, Shiano. I uh, mean, Shiano, you know, was like, okay, well, we need to bring pressure in this situation. We don't need to just sit back and prevent. We need to bring pressure and make it make the ball come out quicker so we get to him before the ball gets deep. And um, when I got to Brom, I just held on. <laughs> so he couldn't throw the ball. That was my only goal. I went right after his arm. I didn't really go for, like, you know, a big hit. Wow. I went to tackle his arm so he couldn't throw the ball. That was my only concern. Brom was sacked. Time expired. And then pandemonium. In case you're wondering, the man responsible for the most famous call in Rutgers history didn't come up with it on the fly. Carlin had pandemonium in Piscataway in his head when he arrived at the stadium. I absolutely did. And look, you can ask 75% of broadcasters and they will say, no, it's off the top of my head. That's garbage. We all think about it and we're lying if we say that we're not. But I was just trying to think about what it was going to be like because you knew the place was going to explode and I don't know where it came from but it just let's all right maybe a little alliteration maybe something but all you're thinking about is god I just don't want to screw it up if it if because we don't get that chance like a a guy who gets to do games you don't get that chance it's the chance that you dream of and it is your number one fear so it everything else I said was off the top of my head. If you listen to it, it sounds like it. <laughs> it was not. It was not the best. But I was. I was fortunate that that it actually. I, and the other thing too is, I wasn't just going to say it just to say it. If it didn't match what had happened, if the game had been a blowout, I might not have said that exactly. I might have come up with some other way if 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 they had blown Louisville out. But you know, the, we didn't think that was going to happen. So, but yes, I had been thinking about it all week. Turns out, there is not a better way to describe the scene in that stadium. It seemed like all 44,000 fans made their way onto the field. Here's one of them, Ryan Cooley, who was a senior at the time. Once we were able to wrestle the field, I got one leg over the fence, 
and uh, saw my last my life flash before my eyes a little bit because my other leg didn't make it over because I was getting kind of bum rushed from from the other side. So it was a little a uh, little terrifying moment, but finally got down there and um, started running around the field like a little kid almost. It's like a like a dream of sorts. Terrifying, exhilarating, pandemonium. Eric Legrand was a high school recruit at the game. He would later become one of the most famous Scarlet Knights and a worldwide inspiration for the way he handled getting paralyzed making a tackle. But on this night, he was just part of the throng on that field. Got to the middle, and it was one of the hottest places I've ever been. It was, I was dying in there. You couldn't move. You couldn't breathe. It was absolutely insane. I lost every one of my friends. I'm like, this is going to be impossible to find everybody. So after you celebrate, you know, I'm getting nervous now. I can't. So I start pushing people out the way, and I finally make it my way out about 20 minutes into the celebration, and I see my one friend Joe Lasala leaning on the uh, wall where the where you could, like, run down, completely out of breath like he just played a football game, like he was about to die out there. And I was like, that was absolutely insane. Imagine now the players. They were caught in the middle of this. Rice just wanted to find his mother, his number one fan. Teal had a state trooper protecting him, preventing his own father from hugging him. No story, however, compares to the one Westerman tells. As every, you know, you're high-fiving your teammates, and okay, one guy jumps on you, you're like, oh, okay, cool. Another fan jumps on you, cool. And then I fall to the ground, and I'm underneath all of it. And you see the little light, and you feel like you're in a movie, and you're getting, you know, you're getting trapped. And you're inhaling and exhaling, and people are just laying on you, and it's getting heavier and heavier. And for a split second, to be honest, I was a little nervous. I'm like, how the hell am I going to get from under here? Because nobody's hearing me. Everybody's going nuts. You want to find your, your guys on the team and celebrate too, but you're, you're stuck on the ground. Somehow, in the middle of this, he finds a treasure. As I'm crawling around them, they're trying to move. The Louisville ball from the last play of the game rolls under my arm. I have the ball at my house. So I have the ball, and I literally start poking our fans in the ribs, just pushing it against them to get guys off of me. And I'm poking them, I'm poking them. You know, you break out of the, you know, out of, out of everything. You kind of, you get that last, you know, that breath of fresh air where you're like, and then you're just screaming, you're happy. I think somebody stole my mouthpiece because it was on my helmet. You know, guys, and people are pulling for your gloves. You know, let me get your cleats, let me get your helmet. You're just looking for your teammates, and everybody's going nuts. And you're just out there, and it's probably, you know, one of the most satisfying, you know, things as a college football player because you don't really see that in the pros. The party continued when the field cleared. Remember, this was a night game. The players didn't get off that field, back in the locker room, and showered until nearly 2 a.m. And still, the celebration raged on. Teal found out the hard way. Finally, when I did go over to College Ave, um, I, I couldn't get across Easton Ave. It was right between uh, Nightclub and Scarlet Pub. There were a lot of people. Still, so this was about 3 o'clock in the morning. There were still a lot of people out on the street. And I rolled down my window, and one of the New Brunswick cops, I guess, recognized me and kind of made a big deal. So I got out of the car and started taking pictures and kind of hung out for a little bit. And then finally they let me cross the street. Bob Mulcahy, the athletic director at the time, found in the locker room the unproven coach he had hired six years earlier. They had suffered through the 1-10 season together through the years of being a punchline across the nation. The, the moment afterward in the coach's room was one of almost, uh, you didn't have to say anything. The struggle, we had reached a significant point in the struggle is the best way I can say it. In some ways, it was like a relief for me if you can understand what I'm saying. Because you worked so hard for so long, made so many decisions, asked people to buy in, and then you achieved it. But you knew there was a lot more to do. In other words, I never looked at it as the end. I just looked at it as another step in the process, but a significant one, one we'd never had before. For one night and the following day, Rutgers, yes, Rutgers, was the talk of college football, the lead story in ESPN, the whole deal. They were 9-0, and rose to number 8 in the nation, and a coveted spot in the Orange Bowl would be theirs if... And that's where the story takes a sad turn. One week later, the perfect season collapsed on a cold night in Cincinnati. The Scarlet Knights lost 30-11. to 
then fell in triple overtime in the regular season finale to West Virginia. Instead of the Orange Bowl, they were in a first-year game called the Texas Bowl. It seemed unfair. It was unfair. Still, that season, and more specifically, that Louisville game was the confirmation that it can happen at Rutgers. It was the night that big-time college football truly arrived in New Jersey. And as Chris Ash attempts to rebuild this program, an important reminder, Cali, who now takes his family to games as fans, sees it as a turning point. You look at what happened with that, that win and, and the ability to, to help springboard the program to you know, consecutive bowl games and, and bowl championships and, and, and players in the NFL. And you look back at it now and, and you, you kind of realize how significant it is. You know, we expect to be in games like that now. We, you know, especially me as a former player, I expect the program to compete for big-time championships. When we win the first big-time championship in program history and we, we do it out in Indiana or wherever they have it at that time, you know, that's going to be kind of, the, in my opinion, the, the next milestone. Rutgers is a long way from competing for that Big Ten title now. Ash will need years of recruiting to elevate this program to a level where it can beat powerhouses like Ohio State. Still, even if he does, you could argue that it won't be as special as that night. Ten years ago, Rutgers did something it had never done before, and everyone in that stadium will never forget it. Steve, what are your memories from that night? It was so memorable. So many things happened. We just went through and heard so many of the players and people involved. There. How about for you covering that? It's funny. It was, it was a night game, so it was a very difficult deadline. And I knew how important it was for the program and for Rutgers. And I wanted to chronicle it as best I could. So you have to go down through the stadium stands to get across the field to get into the Rutgers locker room. And I couldn't physically get through the field. And I started to panic because I'm like, how am I going to get in there to interview the players and the coaches? And it took me like 15 seconds to realize, no, the story is right in front of me. It's these people on the field. It's the joy. It's the hugging. It's the rejoicing. Everyone was just so happy. And that's what sticks with me for a fan base that has really gone through a lot and waited a long time for something. Just the joy. And, and it, was really, it was really something to see the people celebrate that victory. Was there a moment in the game, because we just, we just heard all those stories and going back through the game, and I think all the memories came flooding back. Was there a moment in there, maybe in the moment for you, or now looking back during this episode here, where you realize, oh, wow, they really might win this game because they went down early and it took a comeback, right. and, and they weren't supposed to win the game, even though it turned out in an incredible fashion. Right, yeah, and I had a fun time watching the game again to do this because you forget so many different moments. And what stuck out to me now was after Rutgers scored in the third quarter, late in the third quarter, maybe four minutes left, Shiano went for two, which at the time you think, okay, he's chasing points. It's a little too early. After the Kenny Britt big right, play, right? right, yeah, and he went for two. And it turned out to be a, a really a, a genius you know, a move there because they wouldn't have won that game without that two-point conversion. And I think that might have been the moment when you knew something special might happen. But beyond that, just watching it again, just how good this team was defensively in that second half. I don't think Louisville had a single positive play, much less a positive drive during that stretch. And it was just amazing to see that defense just shut down what was an incredible Louisville offense at that point. Looking back, the coverage really was amazing for what that game was and who Rutgers was and really still is, right? I mean, you were there. Of course you were there. We were there covering it. I was at school. I was in college at the time. And I went to school up in Pennsylvania. I remember everyone talking about, are you going to watch this game? And I was like, I grew up in New Jersey. Rutgers is on ESPN in this game. I'm going to watch this. But how about everyone being there? ESPN, New York, Philadelphia, you mentioned it. Obviously, Mike and the Mad Dog with Russo, uh, given his memories. The, the buildup was, was a lot of fun, too. The, 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 the place, the press box was packed. You had the Bowl Scouts there. You had just a lot of interest for the first time about this program because it was so new. It hadn't happened. And people, not only hadn't it happened, but people were convinced that it couldn't happen. So to have this team now 8-0, the Vic, like someone said to me, the, the opening kickoff was going to be the best moment of the night for them. And then it wasn't because the game was so good. And it was just such a, an incredible you know, announcement that, okay, work, Rutgers can do this. And I think that's what you know, I take away from looking back on that now was just that you know, everyone was witness to that moment that Rutgers can do this. Did you sense this coming at all during that season? I mean, they weren't supposed to be as good as they were. And then they kept winning week right. after week right. leading up to that game. Did, was, did you realize that they could pull that off? Or, or did that surprise you that they got to that point that year? It's funny. Earlier in the year, actually, I wrote a column just sort of like a gag sort of, hey, here's Here's how Rutgers can go to the Fiesta Bowl and play. <laughs> and I just went through each win by win. You know, okay, here's how they beat Navy. Here's how they beat 
UConn. Here's how they beat North Carolina. And it got about seven games through, I started to tell people, like, well, I knew this the entire time. I was just predicting this to happen. When in reality, I, mean, I don't think anyone could have seen foreseen all of those dominoes to fall. I don't even think – I think it happened even ahead of schedule for what Greg Schiano had expected for the program. Of all the people you talked to for this episode, who stood out to you? Maybe the recounts or, or the memories of that game. So many players, Ray Rice, Brian Leonard. I thought Teal was really interesting talking about right. the going that bus ride right to the stadium that day and seeing all those people, which was just so rare for Rutgers right. to have all those people there kind of in their way. But it was an awesome thing for them. Right. And I love the, the story that, that Mike tells about after the game when he, you know, just going going back to town and having a cop seeing who he is and pulling him out of a, his car. And look, we've got Mike Teal here, you know, the, the, the people on in downtown New Brunswick in the, in the celebration. But I think what sticks out to me more than just any one person was just how important this is to all of their lives. I mean, whether it's Ray Rice, who went on to obviously you know, NFL and, and success there and, and some controversy there, or just a guy like Anthony Cali, who was the holder for this Rutgers team. And he, he told me that now he'll, he's in business now, he, you know, in the business world, he will talk to people and they'll say to him, like, look, I've been to World Series, I've been to Super Bowls, that still is the best game I've ever been to. And that's part of his life now. So a story he uses, you know, 10 years later in the business side of his, you know, what he's doing with his life. So it's it's just amazing how that that moment in that game has just stuck with everyone involved. You brought up Cali, and, and there was a story in there where he talked about he brings his kids. I think he goes to the games right. now, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot and of them he, do. Yeah. yeah. So, and he talked about that moment, and that's why I think so many Rutgers fans want this program to turn around because right. they tasted it, right? I mean, Rutgers never had any success really for the most mm-hmm. part. Never had a ball game leading up to that for a long time. Two thousand six, they get to go to the ball game, but then here we go with that game. And that moment, is that why Rutgers fans, you think, they tasted it, they want it again because it I was think so, so close? Right, and I think the other part of that, they tasted it, they wanted it again, and then they really did, the, 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 sad, the, the sad ending to the story is that they really didn't get to the heights they could have. Uh, the next week they lost to Cincinnati, which was just a really depressing complete opposite uh, environment in Cincinnati and the, and it was just a bad the one bad performance they had all year and of course they lost in triple overtime at West Virginia which was just a devastating loss and and the Big East had just gone through all that turbulence so they went from essentially playing in the Orange Bowl to the first time Texas Bowl and the drop was so steep and it was unfortunate because I think that that's that's also part of the story is that you know Rutgers didn't have didn't follow through didn't have that moment where the fan base went to Miami or went to, you know, went to the big bowl game, saw what that was like, that, that moment where you're playing on New Year's Day. Uh, and I think that sticks with a lot of people, too. Now, we could par- probably parallel a little bit to what Rutgers was when Shiano first came in and how high they got to the mm-hmm. moment we're talking about now, too. What this podcast is trying to chronicle right. is they try to rebuild this thing now with Chris Ash. When Greg Shiano first got here, did you ever envision a moment like pandemonium at Piscataway, or did you think that was just too tough of a task for him? Or did you think when you first met him and first started to cover him that, they could have a big moment maybe down the line. You know, I, I, I don't think I realized it could be quite like that, to be honest. No, and I, I think that part of that is because they were so far behind in so many ways. And they were playing teams like Miami and playing teams like Virginia Tech that were so established. And it took a lot of time to build that and to get the belief in that. And some changes in the a Big East obviously helped as well, getting rid of they – they didn't have to play Miami that year to get to that point. Uh, so there was a lot of things that had to happen to make that happen. When you look back now as you did this podcast, and I think this one's going to be one of the more fun ones that our listeners get a chance to look back and relive that day. What was the most fun part for you looking back on the game and talking to all these different people that were involved? I think I just enjoyed, I mean, I so many things I had forgotten and so many little nuances in the game. And I hadn't watched the game again. And I sat down on YouTube and I watched it, you know, and it's just amazing the little little moments in the game that just come back to you and talking to people about them. You know, how it was just great to listen to how enthusiastic they were to share their memories. You know, a lot of times people, when you call them, like, hey, can I, can I bother you for a half an hour? Like, oh, great. Here's Politi. What what does he want? But really, people were very, uh, very enthusiastic to talk about this. And I think that that comes through in just, in some of their answers were just, were just great. Yeah, I have a feeling people are going to want to talk about this one in this game for years. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Next time on Rebuilding Rutgers from the Ashes. Meet the deep-pocketed donors writing big checks to help Rutgers reach the next level in the Big Ten. They are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, highly renowned surgeons, founders of tech corporations, giants in the pharmaceutical industry. And they all have one thing in common. They want to see Rutgers succeed. Just ask Ron Garuti, who has given millions of dollars to the program. 
Now is the time, and I like to talk about this being a window of opportunity. Windows don't stay open forever. Um, the Rutgers donor base, the Rutgers fan base has to step up. Uh, we're playing in the big leagues now.